Um, what I uh, would like to do tonight is not, you know, fully rerun the thing that I laboured over and, and we all laboured over, Louise and Joe DiMoncio and other people involved and Sabrina Organo in putting the exhibition together um, because that's the exhibition and there's a booklet with that that a lot of work went into and a lot of research went into. So the story's up there and uh, I hope you, um, yeah, check it out. But I can talk a little bit about the story behind the story and maybe some of the stuff that didn't quite make the cut and some of the... Um, footnotes, if you like, to, to all that. So I'll get this out of the way as sort of partly my own connection with this, um, you know, rich and diverse tradition of what you might call pulp, pulp culture or pulp, pulp literature. Um, it started quite a while ago, but this is a key moment in it for me, and it's a paperback book I came across maybe in the late 70s or early 80s, I can't quite remember. It's when I was buying a lot of books, a lot of cheap kind of forgotten books in secondhand bookshops around Sydney and in op shops and St Vincent's, St Vincent de Paul shops and places down the coast. And this one uh, was a gold medal paperback that had been published in 19, 1962, Dan J Marlowe, The Name of the Game is Death. And I picked that one up and went, yeah, that's a pretty unusual cover. And that's, there's no subtext there. It's just what it is, a guy shooting another guy. And on the back, um, it, had, it had this blurb written in white uh, lettering on a black background. This is all it said. On the day they sentenced Dolly Barnes to 15 years, I quit the human race. I never went back to my job and I've never done a legitimate day's work since. I bought a gun in a hock shop and was surprised to learn how easy it is to knock off gas stations. The money piled up and I bought a second-hand car and drove the 180 miles back across the state, back to Winnick, the guy who railroaded Ollie Barnes. I rang his doorbell one night and shot him in the face four times. He went backwards in a kind of shambling trot. And on it goes. So I thought, this has got to be goddamn good. And actually, it was. You know, I was buying a lot of... Um, old trash, vintage trash, there was tons of it around, 50s paperbacks, because I'd read Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler and I'd read The Greats and now I was working the way to the not quite great or sort of great or maybe great for a page or two. But this one is great all the way through. Um, it's the best thing he ever did. I've read quite a lot of books by that guy, he's kind of forgotten. Now there's actually a couple of biographies of him and some people regard him very highly, but at the time I didn't know anybody who'd, who'd read them. The book has a really complex structure. It has three timelines in it. It's completely relentless. And I thought at the time, this is kind of to literature what Little Richard is to popular music or Elvis Presley was. You know, it's like all, not all the possible qualities are there, but certain qualities that have, have a lot of energy. They've just, it's been paired back to just that and it's excellent. So um, I've been searching that's been my grail ever since, is to find another Dan J. Marlowe. And there's quite a few, actually, as it turns out, because in America, uh, during the 20th century, there was so much cheap culture produced. There was so much trash culture produced, not highly regarded at the time. Uh, nobody would speak up for it, really. You can overdo how separate it is from, from sort of the more middle mainstream, but still... It, it was a business, but there were tons and tons of titles produced. There were hundreds, there were thousands of people who produced them, and people like Dan J. Marlowe, who was always borderline how much money he was making from it. He was, he was considered the 10th best pulp writer in one poll, in, in one critics thing that was written in about 1962. He went, God damn, I've got to get up, I've got to be better. But, you know, to be among the 10 best, every one of those names, by the way, that was listed back then, is really highly regarded now as literature, as it turns out. Anyway, so that's me. I love that kind of stuff and tried to emulate it in my own writing years later. Um, when I... Um, Doyle needs to make a segue from that to what I want to talk about <laughs> and I'm just trying to fudge it. I'm going to have to put on my glasses to see what my little cheat sheet says here. Okay, this is what I wanted to say about pulp. 
there's a lot being written about it, said about it, and there are a lot of misapprehensions, but the things I guess that for me, the pertinent points, I do work at a university and I can't help but go into lecture mode a little bit, but most pulps are indeed eminently forgettable. You know, there is not much value in a lot of them. Um, but sometimes there's something special and what's special about them is unique and they have pulp culture. I include rock and roll in this country and Western music, all sorts of things. Stock car racing, I don't know, that hasn't really stood the test of time, but maybe, maybe in that world um, people have their grades too. But when it's good, it's good in a very unique way. Um, and that value has something to do with speed, structure and, and an element of, of outsiderness. It's not always there. What was in the name of the game is death. The guy, Dan J. Marlowe, lived in middle America. He lived in a, a, a small city on Lake Huron. He was a Rotarian, a keen Republican. He looked like Mr. Joe Average, Joe Strait. But after he died, people in town said, you know, there's something not right with that guy. <laughs> we, we always, and, and people to this day told his biographer, we always thought he was in the, he was mobbed up, you know, and he might have been, and nobody's really quite discounted. And that thing that I quit the human race, I mean, that sort of spoke to me back that time. So there is a potential for a kind of outsiderness in that culture that maybe you don't get among Booker Prize winning novelists and, you know, Sydney Symphony Orchestra conductors and so on. Although I, actually I could be totally wrong about that and that maybe I am. And like anything that simple, it's almost sure to be wrong. Anyway, I'm sticking with it today. So um, I guess the fifth point I'd make about that is that in all pop culture, uh, ham-fistedness, ineptitude, plain crappiness is never far away, you know, because it's done so fast. There's not time to eliminate error and lack of finesse and grace. And ineptitude, the right sort of ineptitude can be a wonderful thing. Okay, so <clears throat> exactly as Lou said, um, Lou, spotted these covers in the collection. Um, there's, this stuff fills trolley upon trolley upon trolley and they're in great big archive boxes. There's a lot of bits of paper. They're large bits of paper. You will see them upstairs. Some of them have been uh, mounted so you don't see the outsides, but it's lovely to see the grubby finger marks on the edge of these and um, you know the registration marks and so on. And you will see, if you haven't already, the vividness of the colour. You know, they're, they're anticipating the stuff's going to lose a little bit of uh, oomph in the reproduction. So they start, they, they start large and bright, and that's a good way to go. Um, of course, I immediately loved the um, corny but fantastically beautiful settings. You know, a back alley, somebody who's a bit anatomically wonky being chased by a guy in an overcoat and a gun. And I haven't read that one, but The Rocket Range, I've got to check this out. And this is something that turned out to be quite distinctive about all the Frank Johnson material and the Frank Johnson papers is it's decidedly, not exclusively, but very deliberately Australian content. Australian and very deliberately urban a lot of the time. And that's something that we found out dates right back to when Frank Johnson was an idealistic arts guy back in the 1920s and a friend of Norman Lindsay's and the Lindsay family with very high aspirations for Australian, a new kind of Australian modernism. The, about the only thing he seems to have retained is an interest in putting pictures with words, uh, which is no small thing, actually. It's kind of happened again recently and it's happening now, but that was a bit of a, uh, that was a margin, marginal call back then. And uh, I started a sentence and it was put in a clause that was too big, can't get back to the sentence. Uh, but it was something to do with being urban and being uh, visual. And uh, so these are the things that are there. As a number of people have pointed out already, particularly illustrators and artists, the lass's hand is too small for the rest of the body. But, you know, it's nice. And there's something else that starts happening with the, um, with the covers that are, you know, turned up in the Frank Johnson collection, is that um, quite modern. This is 1940s, pu you know, publishing in 1940s Sydney, and something starts going on where the art has a kind of implied or embedded narrative. And, you know, there's 19th century genre painting and, you know, the kind of 
and sort of stuff that, um, you know, I guess Tom Roberts did as well and, and uh, the Heidelberg School, um, as I said, European genre painting, where there is a kind of implied narrative, but here it's a narrative that's full of, full of violence and sexual tension. That's the sort of noir staple, I guess. But it's quite interesting, really, when you get past the hastiness of the artwork um, just who's looking at who and who, what's going on. And, and when you go up and to, to look at the exhibition, if you do, just look at how many pictures have three people in them and are suggesting uh, complex relationships between them. And the artist who we interviewed for the film, uh, Peter Chapman, who was here the other night at the opening, um, who was a 19-year-old when he started doing work for Frank Johnson in the 40s, it, it was a master of of really putting this, the story into the pictures. It's in a way that's quite modern. Some of, his, some of his early work, to his own great chagrin, is rather clunky. He became an absolute master illustrator, uh, just one of the best in the country, acknowledged as such. But when he was a kid, the work's rough and he winced to see it. But still, he does have these very narrative values in there and interesting. And <laughs> this one, I mean, like Tony Johnson Woods, a um, Queensland scholar who writes about this stuff kind of has a whole thing about the place of nipples in, um, in the artwork here. They were very shut down Australia in 1940s, of course, as I don't need to tell you. And, and Frank Johnson, who published this stuff, you know, there's correspondence there where he's pleading with people, you know, remove, you've got bloody in there. You know, you're saying she's, you know, she's in the club, pregnant. And writers writing back to Frank saying, oh, for God's sake, loosen up, Frank. You can say bloody in 1952 Australia. You can say pregnant, but you know he's so wary of crossing the line because there's nothing in it for a pulp publisher to cross the line. You get get as close as you possibly can, but you don't want the cops, you don't want the censors. So, but for some reason, the images were okay. They're sort of pseudo pornography, you know, kind of. But it seems to have come down to how it seems to have come down to how much the wardrobe was malfunctioning, you know, <laughs> like literally. So. As Tony Johnson Woods points out, a nipple underneath a satin dress can be quite pronounced, right? And even a shadow of a nipple that almost looks like a nipple, that's okay. But actually a nipple, the cops would be down there, right? The cops would be raiding the news agent. So it's an interesting kind of brinkmanship going on there. But there, the whole kind of, anyway, I, I, I needn't unpack that image, I'm sure you can see. Yeah, I think Tony talks about that one for the disappearing nipple kind of uh, <laughs> syndrome there. It's there or it's not there. And this one, I just, when I first put this image down in the PowerPoint sl slide and not yet squashed down, it came up like that. And uh, I went, yeah, that's pretty much what it's all about in a way. Too. <laughs> but of course, you know, these, um, these books were probably bought by men and they ended up in, yeah, reasonably respectable houses. There's nothing you know, it's not like buying a dirty book at the time. Um, and they, you know, it's hard to know who actually read them, but I suspect as many women read them as men and the kids, the teenagers read them if they could get their hands on them. Um, it's an interesting. So that's the colour covers. But then as we looked and looked, uh, we found the kind of great body of true crime publishing that Frank Johnson was responsible for. And to do that, he had to enlist, um, I think he basically called every journalist he knew and, uh, or drank with and said, you got anything? And they went back to their various newspapers and looked at their clippings files and started putting them together. So um, in the collection is the large artwork that illustrated not just covers but individual stories inside the long running magazine, Famous Detective Stories. Uh, famous detective, which is terrific. So these were done by some of the artists we know. That's Phil Belbin there, who was a friend and contemporary of Peter Chapman. He too was a young kid, literally a kid at East Sydney Tech, who Frank took a liking to. Something quite interesting to me and quite modern there, that comics and tawdry publishing were a kind of portal for people who never would have got a Guernsey in the media, not that anybody called it the media back then, any other way. So comics, true crime magazines, employed kids as young as 15. And I'll show you some artwork later on, which really has a kind of school kid sort of energy about it and naivety 
Um, but anyway, Phil Belbin, he was a young and, and he too, like Peter Chapman, ended up long after the demise of Frank Johnson Publications, had a long career in the business. Uh, another one of Phil's. Th these are all illustrations for Australian true crime stories and sometimes they got quite, um, that's Peter Chapman there, that's an early Peter one. Well, as I said, three people, often somebody in the foreground, two people behind the person in the foreground, kind of looking at the person in the foreground. Uh, it's a trope, as we say. I don't know, you know, I know a bit of Australian true crime, but I don't know Patrick O'Rourke, I don't know that one. And he worked down to, like these days, if you want to publish anything, do anything on TV that is true crime, non-fiction crime, you need a body. Somebody's got to die. It's got to be murder. Anything less than murder will not, can be robbery so long as somebody dies. In those days, there's not that much murder in Australia. So if you're restricting yourself to murder, you're really limiting your, um, your possible stories. So Frank took stories about confidence tricksters, about payroll thefts, including some quite... Um, interestingly, you know, less spectacular narratives. Anyway, that's the magazine, he, that's the cover of the magazine. That's not from Frank, the Frank Johnson papers, that's actually from the Mitchell Libraries, the State Libraries collection, because they were a lot of deposit library as well, so a lot of the stuff was able, we were able to match it up with stuff in the library. So, so some blousy old sort of colonial Sheila becomes a femme fatale. <laughs> if she makes it to the to famous detective stories, like a contemporary Hollywood kind of look-alike. So the also true, in inverted commas, ghost stories. Yeah. <laughs> I love that one. I mean, this is, again, talking, it's not ineptitude, but, you know, the uh, they basically got about 30, 30 shillings to two quid for an illustration like that per page. Uh, so if you spent all of today and all of tomorrow and all of the day after that doing that picture, you were going out the back door. If you could do that one in a day, you were trading okay. If you could do that one and one other in a day and keep that up all week, then you're earning good money. And that's exactly what uh, Peter Chapman could do. But the haste, as with the, as with the, you know, the name of the game is death, the haste kind of if that can be turned into sort of some energy in the art, it's, it's wonderful and I think it is there um, in so much of this work. The strokes, the, the pen strokes and the brush strokes are there, the kind of energy in the movements. That's another Peter Chapman one, again with three people and somebody in the back getting up to, <laughs> getting up to no good. Particularly love that one. And, and I love you know, being able to see the penciled in. Peter would read the manuscript for the story of the magazine story and and choose an illustration for it. They're given a lot of freedom. I mean, there, there weren't there weren't a lot of um, this wasn't work through focus groups or you know a production meeting around the table on Monday morning where they argued the toss. It was like read that son and make a picture for it, which um, really wonderful freedom. Again, slight analog to kind of trashy rock and roll or punk rock or all sorts of um, undercapitalized or nicely undercapitalized cultural cultural enterprises. And I love this one as well. I mean, Peter, Peter winces when he sees this. Like that guy, he looks like that, <laughs> with the gun on the head. <laughs> it's fantastic. And uh, people like that lovely hand, hand lettering. I mean, the Melbourne Brownout murders, the Leonsky, he was a genuine, you know, a serial killer, people may be aware of in, Ameri in uh, Melbourne during World War II, American GI. This one, we didn't, didn't make it into the exhibition, but it's another, really fantastic one where where the artist has put the little bit of the text that he wants as the caption there. Martha Needle buried her head in the pillow as if in sorrow. That's, that's you know, if I was editing that, I would go, as if in sorrow. Hang on, you don't need the as if in sorrow. Anyway, they are a bit overwritten. But then another one by the same art, artist. Otto kissed her in the condemned cell and then underneath, you beaut. Like, <laughs> What? Well, uh, there's quite a bit of dialogue on these that, so, you know, this is the big kind of, um, a big buzz that we tried to retain in the whole thesis about the exhibition is that it's not, it's not gallery art, it's not something kind of in a gilt frame, although some of it would, could, should, might be, but it's, it's really about an industrial process that involves a great deal of hasty creativity and energy. So. 
Uh, Twain, I like seeing that straight away because I am interested, I'm not an expert, but I'm interested in uh, criminal folklore and I do use it and I happen to know from all the criminal glossaries I've read that Twang is early 20th century underworld slang for, um, for opium. So glad, I mean maybe they got it from this, from this magazine article, whoever wrote the, uh, the slang glossary, but there's quite a bit about opium running. Quite a lot of drug stories in the 1940s Australian uh, true crime and crime fiction, often with a, with a really poisonously, to us, uh, to them, unnoticed racist uh, kind of element because anybody who brings in drugs is always a sort of, you know, grotesquely drawn celestial who speaks in a kind of, you know, burlesque Chinese argo or something. Um, yeah, any racial, ethnic other will be, will be depicted as a grotesque and any Anglo male, um, yeah, will be like those blokes, kind of rugged and yeah. So, um, so it's quite interesting too to me that that Johnson really uh, sort of nurtured and husbanded his growing catalogue as he got more writers to write more stories. He did have to recycle them, and he recycled product. He sold back issues. These are all. I mean, uh, to me, they're quite modern modern practices. I'm not saying that Frank Johnson invented them, but a whole lot of what he did resonates. It's what people do now. What small, what embattled media producers do now. And one of the things Frank did, as I say, was he, uh, he really, he nurtured his audience relations. He asked people to write in all the time. Bear in mind, the office was just him. Sometimes his wife, Vera, sometimes another lady was there. And Raymond Lindsay, Norman Lindsay's underachieving son who was an artist and a writer himself, was content to edit and kind of run things for Frank for years and years. And he died in the same year as Frank Johnson, 1960. So, uh, but, but being a Lindsay, being Raymond Lindsay, he did have actually a literary sensibility. And some of the letters back to the writers are stressing how, you know, it's the kill your darlings kind of advice. Uh, economy, sir, economy is the essence of writing, which it is. Uh, I believe and agree, except when it isn't, uh, and that sometimes happens. Yeah, so uh, kind of lost the point I was making there. Also in the collection, um, uh, back and forth between the artists and Frank. As I say in the exhibition, um, it said, you know, relationship with the relationships with the writers are often very fraught and strained, and even old pals, there are angry letters, old pals, uh, as they say, I'm taking out a bluey on you. They're summonsing Frank to appear in court for not paying. He paid little, he paid late. He'd get out of paying if he could. He'd pretend to forget. And then when he did pay people, something that's happened to me um, back when there was still freelance writing, they give you the check about a minute before the bank closes so that you won't make the bank, so that you won't be able to present it until tomorrow or next Monday. Now, you know, I'm still going to present it. The check's going to get in the system but it's the mark, the eternal mark of the shyster or the borderline operator that even if they can get another day, you know, that's going to save their butt. Anyway, Frank did that and there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's plenty of not just suggestions but explicit unpleasantness. However, there's a lot of affection too and a lot of the artists, um, there's a number of caricatures of Frank Really affectionate letters, decorated envelopes and things. And it's partly because, partly because the artist could come in with their artwork, hold on to it until they, in this hand, until they got the check in that hand. The writer sent the stuff in, but the artists were right there. And they still, you know, they, they mucked them around if they possibly could, Frank did. Particularly the youngsters, Peter Chapman and Phil Belbin. Oh, yeah, you know, you know, come back to Savo, mate. I'm, I'm too busy now, you know, get your check. And, uh, but they did get the check. And all these, all the artworks, you know, a lot of them have a big page stamp on the back. So, so they're doing okay. And they, the artists seem to have known better how to play the game. And they would be selling their artwork to all sorts of outlets in Sydney. And in those days, being a professional illustrator, it was like being a dance band musician, I think. It's, it's like, it's on the cusp of art and trade, uh, but it employed quite a few people and it was respected, uh, you know, a middle class kind of job. 
uh, yeah, so the artists, they, they, knew how to, they knew how to be freelance artists and Frank knew that. So of course then the backstory, which is explained uh, upstairs a bit, little bit more, turns out that Frank Johnson hasn't always been exploitation king, Mr. Pulp. He used to be Mr. Art and he published the famous and the legendary Darlinghurst Nights, the great Australian modernist work by Kenneth Slesser about Darlinghurst. That's all up there, the original artwork, some of it is up there. Here's a little bit of it here. Gardens in the Sky, that's like a garden in William Street in Sydney in a block of flats from 1933. So yeah, that's one of the decorated envelopes that turned up in the collection, um, Noel Cook. So you see that, it's just a little letter, a postcard or something sent to Frank from wherever. Um, but he's gone to quite a bit of trouble and you don't do that to somebody you hate. But then again, he is getting checks from Frank on a regular. Transport to the world of fancy fiction and fact. And this one too, which is reproduced very large up there, came from, is that also Noel Cook from overseas? And there's a kind of slightly naff gag there where the nerdy, geeky, sort of, un, whatever, non-he-man bloke is saying, who is the publisher of that book? The culture and stimulation of the growth of the mushroom. It's, it's a bestseller. For, it's, if it's a bestseller, Frank Johnson. Now, a kind of naff joke, but actually... That is sort of true. That is the in-house, like Frank would do pulp, but it's one of the misapprehensions about pulp that people often have is that people who did trash, who did com comics or cheesecake magazines, that's what they did and that's all they did. But in fact, the history Grove Press and Olympia Press sort of right through the world in the 20th century seems to be the people who did pulp also did really quite cutting edge literature as well if they thought they could move a few units. They didn't really care. They were equal opportunity exploiters. So, and Frank Johnson did do that. He did do Australiana, he did do natural history as well. He did quite sober and serious books also. Um, so he would have done The Culture of the Mushroom if he, uh, if he thought he could <laughs> make a quid with it. And there's another one by, um, a, a, another friendly, friendly caricature of Frank. Uh, suggests a bit, um, musician, philanthropist, philatelist, philanderer country squire, racehorse owner, punter, Frank Johnson. It was a heavy drinking scene, as you can imagine. So we found lots and lots of just these little incidental story illustrations. These, this one is in the exhibition. It's quite pretty. It's just a tiny little thing. Joan Lynn Todd, who is a gallery artist, a, a, a proper exhibiting fine artist as well. Um, I really love the, the single panel cartoons. There's a lot of these, again, back to sort of nippleology here. Um, this one, I'm not sure was ever printed. Uh, but the early 40s, Colin Robertson does quite a bit of it. You know, the, these gags are still around. You know, the two showgirls or gold diggers who are out to, to kind of snare a kind of fat old moneyed fool. Um, lovely stuff like this. Um, Unk White, Unk White, who even then was a household name in Australia, like a good illustrator, could be like a good musician. People knew him. I mean, I, that's a, quite an old-fashioned style, I would call that. But the evocation of light there and the fire with just those few energetic strokes. So I think it's bloody awesome. Um, uh, there's a little series there for a book he did of Sydney, just contemporary sites of Sydney. I mean, this is getting into quite middle middle market here. There's not, this is not pulp exploitation. Uh, there you go, a, a kind of windbag in the domain. This one, another Colin Robinson uh, gag. Interesting, well, I didn't see this one printed anywhere, but it could well have been. Um, it's a sort of joke it's a mildly homophobic joke. It's like up the road in Queen Square and there's the Queen at Queen Square. Get it? Like? Yeah? Yeah. Right. Very fun. But still, actually, that's a little bit edgy for the time. Um, and it gets edgier when they get into uh, the trench humour. Now, we don't have the records in the collection about this exactly, but um, they prove it. But I suspect that Frank was able to sell a lot of books of gags to the armed forces who distributed them among the troops because a lot of this stuff, a lot of these books of gags, there's not a gag, that's just, you know, war artist stuff. I think that's an Unk White, yeah. But some of and that lovely, lovely, hate. Unk White was a war artist and he sent the, and Frank published his stuff. Then you get into gags like this, it's sort of the encounter with America in New Guinea and in Australia. Um, some, of it, some of that's quite poisonously racist too, although they would be surprised if the artists were here now to hear us 
say that. They wouldn't have been aware of it, I suspect. And this stuff, getting quite edgy. Quite a few gags about diggers in the Middle East in World War II going to brothels. Which is interesting. I don't think you could really publish that in Australia at the time, or maybe you could. Standards suddenly changed in World War II. There's one, I couldn't find it again, there's one gag where the bloke's outside the brothel and there's a lass like that there, and he's asking her, or he's saying something like, my dad was here in 1917, and uh, <laughs> he's, he's expecting. But a lot of this, there is an anxiety in wartime, sort of, you know, gender roles are really changed, and women, this was talked about in the press at the time, of course, that women were working and women were getting uppity in ways they'd never had been before, and it's quite a sweet gag, I think, this one, where she's uh, swilling the champagne for the thing. But this one, now, I don't know if, th this couldn't be printed here. Uh, what are you congr uh, celebrating, Jim? Strike me blue, the missus just had a nipper, has a nipper. Blimey, ain't you been out here 18 months? Too right, but she reckons it was delayed action. <laughs> and, uh, and not that hilarious, but you know, really what that's saying, the anxiety that that's approaching is quite interesting. And similarly, this one. So here's the digger who's home for a little while. And she's saying, are you too tired to turn in, darling? Like, you know, uh, things aren't great. Things aren't great in the, in, in the bedroom. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, stuff like that wasn't really addressed in media in Australia or America or England, really, until the 60s, it, maybe maybe the 50s. And again, this one too, uh, where uh, the caption, oh, I've cut it out, and it's something about, anyway, <laughs> it's something about looking after the troops. He's going, isn't it, I know we're supposed to look after the troops, but isn't that taking it a bit far? <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, I was quite interested in all that stuff. Um, Look, I won't bang on for too much longer. There's correspondence in there, including a letter from B. Miles. It's upstairs. You can read it. It's fantastic. It's from Long Bay Jail, the great B. Miles. Uh, Frank was going to publish B. Miles. There's stuff right back, manuscripts of hers, right back to the early 30s. And one of them, one of which is pretty interesting about her stay as an attractive young woman in the early 30s at the reception centre at Darlinghurst, the, the mental hospital. And it's a sort of first-person account of her incarceration, you know, in the bug house. And it's pretty interesting uh, because at one point she talks about somebody has it in for her and starts doing stuff. And B, as I say, is an attractive young woman, middle-class woman, says, but I've got her behind the shed and sorted her out. So <laughs> it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a really quite hard-edged jail, jail memoir. Um, yeah, and this one is in the collection too. It's not in the exhibition, but... Uh, Manuscript, eh? Right. Uh, drop it in here. I'll look at it shortly. I'll look at it later. Yeah, and pointing out the waste paper bin, of course. And uh, this, if you get up to the exhibition, have a look at H.L. Mansfield stuff. It's completely weird. It wasn't published. I love it. It was submitted in the 30s. Frank Johnson hung onto it. I think he saw that it had a kind of outsider art, Max Ernst, surrealist kind of quality. Completely naive, I believe. Um, H.L. Mansfield supplied a whole lot of artwork, all of which has dental and medical themes, and a manuscript for a novel, which also has medical, dental, espionage and murder themes. And the opening scene is in the Café Swastika in Melbourne in 1933. So go figure. Other stuff that wasn't published is this one, which I particularly love. Um, it's a wartime thing. I don't think it was published. It's hard to tell. We don't have full records, but uh, it's a little scrap uh, a little, you know, uh, what do you call it, like a photo album, uh, writ handwritten by Rita Henderson, Holds in Jiu-Jitsu. Very wartime. This is Holds in Jiu-Jitsu for women. So they look like they're out at the dance, and that could be a brother in the nice knitted vest and everything. But anyway, he's an evil, he's an evil predator in this story. And uh, that, if you can read it, this is repelling the attempted kiss. And I particularly love that as photos. And, of course, the magazines had those make your life better in one simple fell swoop that'll cost you five bob. No contentment, cash in on your ambitions, have business and social success, develop the will and energy to be prosperous, gain love, friendship. I mean, this is modern spam, of course, uh, emails. Make life a joyful adventure. Awaken tremendous mental power. Know the secrets revealed. Incomplete instruction course, the power of creative mind. Which, of course, all the small magazines and the working magazines for working people were full of those things. 
It was either through the secrets of self-improvement or the piano or the mouth organ. Amaze your friends and family and so on. Be the life of the party. Uh, mention in very quickly a bunch of uh, publications and, oops, and the artwork up there. Uh, racing fiction seems to be an Australian genre. Uh, wasn't invented by Frank Johnson. New South Wales Bookstore Company did it right back at the beginning of the 20th century. But stories, stories set around the racetrack, perennial in Australia. It's way before Dick Francis and before the genre hits America. So we invented that. And I love that one too because the urger, particularly that's Australian slang, of course, for a race course, kind of con artist tout, as, as some of you will know. <coughs> And then when he got into the comics, I really wanted to talk about the comics, but maybe I'm just going to give five minutes to the comics and then I'll shut up and uh, take a few questions or comments. But the comics were really wonderful. So what happened, and this is what triggered Frank out of fine arts publishing and worthy literature and you know poetry and art and poetry and art combined, was when the war broke out, uh, there were to be no imports of, uh, no printed imports that, that didn't, weren't directly relevant to the war effort. So um, Australians have been buying comics in great numbers, particularly just the last few years. Superman had recently become the big thing and other superheroes with sort of supernatural powers or strange unexplained powers had become really big. The supply was cut off overnight. So a few low, you know, people like Frank Johnson went, hang on, I know writers, a million of them. I know artists, a million of them. I know printers, I know editors, I know a distributor. No brainer, do comics. So he did, he got quite estimable artists like Unc White and Emile Mercier involved. To Unc's undying credit, he seems to have thrown himself into it with great energy and uh, kind of fun. Um, they, they would never have bunged on any side about this back in the day. But they suddenly overnight they came up with a bunch of kind of heroes, rugged heroes. So you can see a few of them there. This might be an unquiet cover. I don't know whether, but it might be, it could be Noel Cook as well. Anyway, they, um, the eagle, he can fly. Now, I mean, the artist made a mind came the other night, a cartoonist, and he went, wow, that's really, that's medieval. You know, that's like, it's a demon. It's an angel, what? It's great, I love the eagle. Uh, he's a flying character, as you can see. Some of them, he looks like a bit of, like a big chook, but in that one, he, he looks genuinely a bit scary. Uh, Val Blake, ventriloquist adventurer. Not a job description you see a lot. Uh, <laughs> Buck Wayne, railroader. Uh, quite a bit of his histori you know, historians and, and uh, historians of Australian art interested in, in Moira Bertram. I think she did start this stuff when she was 14, a schoolgirl at Skeggs. Um, she published for Frank. I think she published in the Bulletin or one of the daily papers before she started doing comics for Frank, but it's really, uh, really interesting. Winner comics, he had to have a different title for every issue each week because you couldn't publish a new serial. But there's some more of the heroes, Terry Lawson, Rover Scout. The, the whatever you call the bloke in the cow, sort of gothic horror figure. This is a little bit before American comics got really weird, um, Crypt of Terror and so on, which really sparked a backlash in America and, uh, you know, house inquiry and, and a lot of restrictions on comics. But there are some real sort of Edgar Allan Poe horror sort of stuff, uh, horror elements creeping in there. Greg Bartlett's a great favourite of mine. Um, his designation is uh, lineman, linesman. He's a PMG linesman. <laughs> That's it. That's as good as it gets. He climbs up the pole, he fixes the line, you know. He comes down again drives away in the truck. But sometimes he encounters bad robbers and people and he deals with them. But even the name, like if you're inventing a superhero and you call him Greg Bartlett, it's just like, like he's got to exist. It's like, it's too real. It's, I, I, I like that a lot. I like that really a lot about Frank Johnson stuff. Thrilling, again, House of Fear, that, you know, that's early 40s. I think that's early 40s, but uh, the, the art style is a little bit old, but the girl there and with the white eyes and the white teeth and coloured in, to me that's quite a modern motif, you know. That, that's a little bit of its time or even a, a bit ahead of its time in some ways. And on they go. And the comics are um, really lovely. The, the collection includes 
those bits of tracing paper with the, uh, you know, they didn't they didn't leave they didn't leave the artist's place as a coloured work. They were just a black and white piece of art with a bit of tracing paper with that rough colouring in to indicate what colours the printers were to make all that. So to me, that's quite interesting. Some of it's rather inept, like Skip Dolan, whose arm left arm is way too long. Uh, <laughs> But there's a lot. There's a lot of Skip Dolan. Uh, it does get a bit better. But then this is something I like, and it's a rather hard to do in an exhibition, and there's not too much of it there, but i just talk about it now, is that even, you know, ineptitude can be good when, when the energy... When, ineptitude can be OK when, it's, when it permits energy, when it permits a kind of couldn't-give-a-shit sort of energy into the work. And I, I really like that in, in things. And this has it. So... So that, that panel there with the kind of rippling water and this panel bottom left and this one here, I really love. Uh, he didn't agonise over that, but the lovely brush strokes, again, in that one too. Um, don't know who that artist is, the cover. And that's Moira Bertram who I was talking about before. With a lot of these things, you can see it really is like the kid, it might be you or your brother or sister, the one who when they're 14, is at the back of the class just all day long drawing, you know, copying, drawing cartoon characters and stuff. And Moira, you can really see her character, Joe, in a magic cape, who's sort of in Southeast Asia fighting the Japanese, helping our lads. I mean, that plane down the bottom left-hand corner <laughs> looks like it's a talking plane, right? There's a surreal element there, not intended. But, oh, there's Joe there. So every, every time Joe is in the panel, She's like striking a pose because, you know, Moira Bertram's a teenage girl and that's what she likes, drawing women in athletic or balletic poses. And the lovely, amazing way of drawing the hair there is kind of getting quite abstract. And uh, sometimes that, that's, that's Peter Chapman who loved doing maritime stuff. And again, you can see the great big... Lots of colour. I, you know, asked him when we talked to him, what did you have a sort of studio set up at home by that time? And, uh, you know, a whole bunch of sable pens. He said, no, nah, one pen, one brush, kitchen table at home, you know, at his parents' place. And, uh, oh, there's another one, Joe. Striking a pose, flying towards the massive head of the onrushing beast, as you do. And this is, this is, I think, a Skip Dolan one, where, again, no great achievement technique-wise, but weirdness. You know, I love it. Snitchy Telephones Headquarters. I love that. I love Barty Malone, taxi driver. <laughs> he drives around Sydney, picks up girls like that who are in the end of dark streets and in distress. I really love that they thought that the back streets of Sydney could be a cool place, you know. <laughs> Interesting things could happen like that. Barty Malone in his taxi is cruising along the street when in front of a hotel. They are overtelling there a little bit. The Savoy Hotel. Uh, yeah, just little moments. And again, another slightly inept one where it's almost like the representation's almost falling down. It's almost not even representational anymore. It's just wavy, lovely wavy lines. Beautiful, beautiful line. We'll stop at that. I reckon somebody ought to pinch that one for their, for their underground radio program at FBI, pronto. Okay, I will take questions and thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. Yeah.